damn it. My camera doesn't really have good exposure. It really seems to make this pretty hard. So, um, today I'm going to be showing you guys a project that started off as a fun little shenanigan and actually became kind of a serious project. I apologize for any mess you're going to witness in this place. It's, uh, I was cleaning it yesterday, never got around to really the organization aspects, and my workbench is covered with shit. What you're looking at is homemade art. This is a 700, really it's a 600 watt, but I've noticed it can do about 700 with ease. Uh, generator I made from trash. And I'm going to go bit by bit in exactly what this is, how it works. But uh, for better reference, I am going to use original diagrams based upon the home, excuse me, home light or whatever the hell generator. All these home lights were originally was Yamaha EF600s, but this is a night this generator was built in 1998. I don't know how many they sold. There's not much information on the internet about them. When I got this, it was literally in pieces and there was missing pieces. A lot of missing pieces, as a matter of fact. The only part that I actually had of this was the stator slash alternator system. And that was really it. I didn't even have an engine that worked. The engine was missing a head. Uh, the valves were burnt. I don't know what the hell this thing was put through. But the the block was... It was done. The block was done. And so I scavenged around to see exactly what kind of an engine it was. Because all I really got was the base. And the engine was toast. And I don't know exactly... Where I was able to find it, but uh, I couldn't find really anything for cheap on Craigslist. And this kind of was put on the back burner for a while. I ended up finding an engine that I thought would fit this. It was like a Yamaha. I don't know what exactly it came off of. It looked like it came off of like a water pump or a pressure washer or something like that. It was like an uh, an outboard engine thing. I, uh, the guy just wanted the engine. It was sitting in his garage. I asked him what it was, and he said that I, I just... Pulled it off of an old, I don't even remember what he said. And I asked him how much he wanted for it, and I took a look at it, took the head off, and poked around at it, and it actually looked to be in very decent shape. So after negotiating with him, I ended up buying it, which was nice because I really wanted it. And it turns out that this engine block fits onto this. Uh, alternator thing. I think this was an outboard engine for like a little boat or something. I'm not exactly certain to be fair, but I do know that it fits really well on this and it seems to have seated properly. So yeah, that's what that is. So it is not the original engine. Now let's, let's go on to the uh, exhaust. The exhaust, that looks like a stock exhaust for this thing. I didn't have the muffler when I got it. Uh, this actually came off of a Yamaha leaf blower of some kind, um, like the, the push behind ones, the ones that are used to push a lot of leaves across the yard, one of those, and, uh, it just fit on there, so I was alright with that, and it's very quiet, believe it or not, and so yes, I did get the fuel tank with this thing, but the fuel tank was just, you don't want to know what kind of anal shit the Japs do when it comes to fuel delivery, um, I, I, I don't know if you guys have ever worked on the Yamaha carburetors that come with these things. They're very, just say interesting is the most appropriate term I can think of. Interesting is the most appropriate term. They have this weird gravity feed system, but it's also vacuum assisted through a vacuum based fuel pump that is not quite really ran on vacuum, but is also using oil pressure and all sorts of crazy crap. And uh, I'll show you the diagram right now, and I'll also voice over it. And, and so, yeah, so basically what I said was, well, fuck that. I've got this little shitty fuel pump. It's a vacuum-based fuel pump. It's a diaphragm vacuum-based fuel pump that runs into that intake manifold. 
So as long as the carburetor isn't wide open, which I'll explain why this carburetor can't be wide opened in a little bit here, um, it will be able to create enough vacuum to push on the diaphragm, which allows the fuel to be delivered up. And the original fuel tank looked like it had been cracked in a weird way. I didn't trust it regardless. So I, I just put like this little shitty Briggs and Stratton uh, small lawnmower engine based fuel tank on the side just to kind of, you know, call it a day. Uh, this engine probably is around 70 something cubic centimeters. It's probably a little bit less because this head, um, I actually kind of like did a trick that my friend told me to, where you lay the head on a very flat and level surface and you kind of take a ball pin hammer and a piece of plywood and lay the plywood on the head and just smash the fuck out of it. And, uh, and the idea is you can increase the compression a little bit. And also, I re-threaded the spark plug um, threads here because I didn't like the way that it was threaded originally. So, I put in this pretty decently high quality, and you can see my ghetto-ass uh, spark, uh, spark plug coil job here. Yeah, if you're, if you're not careful, this will shock you. I'm going to put a label here that says, don't fucking touch. Because uh, not only does this get very hot up here, but you know this, this will shock someone. It's an air-cooled engine, so of course we need some form of air cooling. It uses uh, a capacitor-based discharge thing, as you can see. It's just a magneto-based uh, capacitor spark, as far as I know. It may not be magneto. I'm not sure. I've never really messed with it. I just kind of left it on the pull housing that was a part of the outboard mower, or was part of the original generator. I just said, okay, well, let's just wire this. If it was wired like this, it makes spark. Who cares? Because I was just fucking around and trying to build something for the shits and thrills of it. How this alternator works is uh, it has an alternator. It's an alternator-based generator. It does not generate power through the actual windings here. So what happens is it needs a small generator, a small little DC motor generator, to create 12 volts DC. And what the alternator does is it steps up the windings through the making and breaking of windings. If you, if you know electrical stuff, you could probably describe this better than I can because I'm not a professional electrician. But basically, the basic behind it is it makes and breaks the windings and amplifies it and basically doubles the voltage with the rotations of the engine. And that puts out 120 volts. So you are physically limited on what the stator is able to replicate. And also with the generator built in, I believe, on the underbelly of this thing somewhere. Uh, that makes, it's like over here somewhere. That makes the 12 volts. The 12 volts come up into this dude in here. And it goes to like where it needs to go. And you can actually charge something on this, which is kind of cool. And uh, yeah, so the DC protection here is actually, uh, this system is here simply because, you know, I think when they originally made the Home Light series generators, I think it was designed to be kind of one of those gen sets where people could stick outside their car or if they had a BBQ or if an emergency happened, they could store it in a work van. And if necessary, they could charge their uh, car battery off of it. I don't actually have one of those connectors, but I could probably make one with ease, just using an old electrical cord and just bend the pins in a specific way, although it probably wouldn't be that good of an idea. Actual voltage of this guy is... is uh, Pretty decent. It puts out about 120 volts right on the par of 115, um, which is nice. And the engine itself, I believe, is 70 cubic centimeters, probably 69-ish, like a little under um, 70 at this point, like 69.9 something. I, I don't know. Somewhere in that range because I did, you know, I did bang in that head pretty badly. Oh, yeah, the head gasket's fucked. And I'm missing head bolts because my stupid ass reused head bolts. Don't ever reuse head bolts, okay? You're never supposed to reuse head bolts. The reason I reused head bolts is because I'm a, I'm a professional retard, okay? D d d take my word for it. So it kind of like spits and shits oil and residue out of the head gaskets over here. I'm not even sure how oil residue is managing to break its way up through the O-ring. So something tells me that the outboard engine that I originally got this engine from... Um, the O-rings on the piston are, have seen better days, but I don't care, which is awesome. Uh, oddly enough, it does have an oil light, and it will come on if it's making unsatisfactory oil pressure, or if it's too cold, it'll, it'll come on, 
and if it's cold and whatnot. And I've only seen it come on once when I first got the thing started and I refilled it with oil. Right now it's got full synthetic S and W. Uh, I believe it's like S A E full synthetic. I think it's five W dash twenty. It should really have five W dash thirty. I don't think 5W-20 is a good oil for it, and it's probably blowing by the cylinder uh, O-rings, or the piston O-rings, and that's probably why we've got oil residue buildup coming out of the sides where the head gasket would be. And it's only the spots where I'm missing the head bolts. I've got other head bolts surrounding it, and so I've kind of just not given a shit and just kind of like rolled with that. I'm not in the mood to have to go ahead and drill down into the cylinder head and having to re-thread that. So I've, I've just gone with this. I don't care. Honestly, this was a shits and giggles project. And maybe if it comes down to it, I'll make a more professional and nicer looking version of this. But yeah. Um, uh, horsepower and compression. This thing originally had very little compression. I don't know if it was how they were from the factory. But it must have been making like six. Six to something. Six to zero out of one. I don't know. Uh, I have the schematics originally of what it's making. It, I can't say for sure exactly what the compression ratio is because I don't have the proper tools to measure such, but it's definitely a lot higher than what it specifies, and I know that from experience. Um, so I don't know exactly why it's rated so low. I don't know if it's because the O-rings are not that great. And, but you got to remember, this engine design and this whole assembly right here is from parts ranging from 22 years ago and from maybe 10 years ago so it is an older engine the engine itself and the alternator assembly is 22 years old and the electronics strapped on here are from the actual alternator i got so that's 22 years old as well the only thing that's actually new on this is probably the plugs the oil and like i, I redid some of the mounts there they were going out i bought some cheap shitty mounts online and i got some of this uh you know, some of this tubing and the carburetor and whatnot on here is much newer. It's probably 10 years old at the most. Overall, this costed me maybe nothing. If I didn't redo the mounts, it would cost me nothing. I probably spent... Because this was all trash, I should mention with you. I was going to throw away this engine. I didn't have a use for it. I couldn't find a use for it. And I said, why the fuck did I buy this thing? I only bought it for a couple bucks, really. The guy didn't even want it in his garage. It was just clutter. But, um... And really, I shouldn't say a couple bucks because I, I worked on fixing something for him as computer and he ended up giving it to me. So, you know, I basically got it for free. But, um, yeah, the alternator and stuff was given to me. The guy didn't want it. Again, it was another thing of clutter from someone else's house. So, uh, if I didn't buy the new mounts down there, it would have been free. Uh, the mounts, I don't know how exactly how much they costed me. I was, I don't remember exactly. And I only re really replaced that one right there. So overall, in total, uh, it's not a bad system. It's served me pretty well so far. Well, let's go over to the fuel delivery side and uh, talk a little bit more about the and what exactly this engine is. So this is like a Yamaha Universal Series like light duty motor of some kind. Yamaha made these for like leaf blowers and small. This the very compact flathead engine basically that was universally able to be applied on vertical uh, applications and it is a very decent flathead engine I'm not gonna lie the valves I've reseated and resealed so it wasn't really making good compression with the original valves and I used a much higher quality seal gasketing on the valves so now it's sealing properly uh, again it's a flathead engine so they're very very easy to work on literally the head is just this piece right here with the spark plugs on and the spark plug sits, oddly enough, right above the valves. It's kind of a shitty design, in my opinion, because if you have a bad head like I do, and it decides where it wants to ignite very aggressively, um, and you don't have the timing spot on, it will shit oil and, and residue and crap out of the sides of the engine because it's going to ignite over here first, then over on the cylinder. So I've thought about flipping this, the head around, but... Um, I've looked into flipping it around to get better engine performance, but honestly, it, it, it wouldn't line up properly, and even if I could get it to line up properly, I'm concerned because this actually is ridged over here for that reason, that it wouldn't make good power, and so I just managed to keep it the way it was. 
Overall, it's not bad. The engine itself, as you can see, it's kind of warped itself a little bit. The, the head is actually a little bit warped from where I was hammering it down. But uh, the overall displacement, again, is around 70 cubic centimeters. So it's, it's a very big engine for the form factor that it is because this is my entire hand sitting on top of the cylinder head. And that's, you know, my fingers are probably still longer than the actual cylinder itself. So very, very... What can I say? It's a Japanese engine. The Japs are really phenomenal when it comes to making them compact. Uh, one last thing. This is a 22-year-old engine, and I know a lot of people are going to sit there and really pick a bone and uh, fight with me over this, but this engine is not CNC machined. Do You cannot change my mind on that. I know this for a fact because of the way that this engine was bored out when I saw the inside of that cylinder head and the, and the actual walls and whatnot. That was never, ever, ever bored out with a CNC machine. It looks like they took a giant ass drill and just fucking went at it. And now I know a lot of their bikes back in the 90s. Yamaha made some really nice bikes as well as some of their engines. And those were definitely CNC machine. But this was not. This was meant to work for maybe a couple of years. And then you throw it out and buy a new one. So the fact that it's lived as long as it has as an outboard motor, uh, this particular engine was. Uh, for a boat is pretty phenomenal to me and it deserves a lot of respect all right let's wrap up the explanations i'm going to get to the actual valves uh part right here so it is a flathead engine so you've got your exhaust valve here and your intake valve here and your valves literally sit right up here and they open and shut with the rocker on the actual uh cam which is right next to the crank it runs on a gear shaft on an actual gear uh train so no belts, no chains, you gotta change, which is nice. It makes it a pretty bulletproof engine. The cam is as good as good as long as the engine is, and as soon as the engine's not making good compression, the cam's pretty much done. And the cam is stock to this engine. I never touched that and I had no reason to. So right here is the oil rebreather. I'm gonna get into this. Um and because there's movement inside the engine, uh underneath the engine where the oil is that it needs to be able to breathe. So I didn't block it off like some idiots do because when you block it off, you start making immense amounts of oil pressure, and what that turns out to is you're going to have excessive blow-by. And while it's a good thing to have lubrication on the cylinder walls, it's a bad thing when you've got too much of it because you're going to cause catastrophic damage to your O-rings and other shit could go wrong, and you don't want blow-by. I don't care what you guys say with your Honda Civics, all right? This comes up here and drops right into the carburetor, and the reason I did this is because... It makes a nasty smell, and it like you could see here, it was building up a lot of residue on the side here, and it's just like, this is disgusting, because you're blowing a lot of air up here, and what happens is you've got your fan, which is attached to the crank, that just kind of like blows air over here, and it just kind of like squirts onto the exhaust, and it smells terrible, and it's just like, I want, I want it to at least have some emissions compliances. So I went ahead and I just ran a tube that goes up to here to the intake, where the, uh, or where a choke would be on the carburetor. Um... Speaking of which, the carburetor is a Briggs & Stratton, uh, one of those engines over there actually, it's a 140cc style carburetor, one of the brand new ones, or the newish style ones, made of plastic. I'm not big on these, but you know, honestly, it's really a lot of carburetor for this engine. As a matter of fact, there's way too much carburetor for this engine. Um, it's probably twice as much what it should really have, but, um, because this engine is not meant to rev really high, and even if it, it does rev pretty high for a flathead engine, I'd say roughly it does about five to six grand for a flathead, and that's just pure valve flow, and you can hear the valves floating, by the way, in this thing when you really rev it high, it starts getting pretty bad where the piston actually starts hitting the cylinder head, so, uh, again, not too good, not too good, um, so, Yes, if you over carburet it, you will hear it and it'll literally start gassing fumes out of here and it's, it's bad. So what I have to limit that is I've designed a governor system. I'll explain that in a little bit here as well. So you got your air filter. It's an oil rebreather filter that is all smashed up. And I don't remember where this came off of. I think it was from my Volvo. I think I had this re the rebreather from my uh, oil pieces in my Volvo. So it just kind of like on there. And then it's just kind of like crimped onto a, a coolant hose for a heater car. And then that goes and it's just kind of like <laughs> freaking hose clamped onto whatever the fuck this thing is. It's a carburetor mount for a Briggs & Stratton 190cc carburetor. And that's just kind of like gasketed and then just like 
hot glued and, and screwed on to the carburetor intake. And it does work, because um, I do care about my engines, at least this one. This one's actually been running really good, and I might actually end up drilling out these holes that I've made on the head here and actually uh, re-threading them and putting new bolts in there. But these bolts cannot be removed. I reused them, and they've been stretched too far, and at this point, if they do... I mean, I never put a torque wrench on these, so they're they're too stressed. If I take them out, I'm going to end up having to redo all the threading, which is going to be kind of a bitch. Anyhow, uh, the carburetor itself, let's, let's talk about exactly where the gas comes from. Obviously, it goes from the bottom of the tank, comes up to the filter, comes because I put really shitty gas in this thing all the time. So I'm going to put, obviously, a filter on there. Filter runs up here to this really shitty delivery. It goes into the intake of the fuel pump, and then the outtake, it literally just goes into the carburetor. And uh, so, yes, I used to have a return system because I thought it was flooding the carburetor too much, but it turns out I didn't need it, so I just bypassed it. Because I was originally driving this off of the oil rebreather, which made way too much positive pressure on this pump. And it ended up breaking it a lot. And I, I had a feeling I was going to break this. So I just said, okay, well, we're not going to do that anymore. We're just going to run it off of the intake manifold, which works perfectly. And it's kind of a bitch to start because when it's been sitting for a while, you lose fuel pressure. It's not going to want to be the easiest to start. But you can always spray some ether or put some gas on the filter or... Do the Cosby method, which is where you take a, a rag full of gas and you just kind of like smother the intake, or in this case the filter, and eventually it likes that and it will start up. There isn't a choke, unfortunately, so it does make starting it first time kind of tedious. Of course, you could always take this hose off like so, and uh, like this, and what you do is you just start blowing in there, just inhaling, exhaling, because it's a diaphragm that you got to push, and that'll normally prime it up, and I'll do that right now. You're not going to suck in any gas, of course. It's not that kind of a method. It's a completely closed loop, but I still don't recommend it for most people. So you, I don't know if you could hear it, but right there, oh, yeah, that, uh, I shouldn't have done that. <laughs> yeah, I don't recommend anyone doing that, because I'm pretty sure I tasted gas. Uh, not tasted it, but I tasted it in, my, in terms of smelling it in my nose, so we might get high here in a little bit. Whoops. Okay, so don't ever do that, <laughs> unless you're a professional retard like I am. Don't ever want that stuff in your lungs, but anyhow, you could probably hear it. It was bringing up gas, and it closed the float bowl in the carburetor, so we've got, it's primed up. So typically when you've got it primed up like that, you just pull it, and it, it starts right away normally. It, keeping it running is questionable. Normally, it's going to be a little finicky, but once you get it running stably for more than a minute, it's solid golden at that point. And we'll get a demo of it starting here. Alrighty, before we start it, I want to talk about the actual governor system. Because this is a very crude and disgusting governor, but it works really fucking well. So because this carburetor makes way, way too much CF image are way too much uh, fuel mixture for what this engine can handle. It's a rich fuel mixture carburetor, but it leans out. But you got no choke on there. You can't really lean it or richen it. You just kind of have to hope that you run lean. You can hear it hissing right there. It's hissing because I have it primed up with gas right now, so it's putting some gas in the carburetor. Um, how the governor works is obviously it's a simple governor. When the crankshaft starts making a lot of pushing, the oil pressure pushes this rod out, which then helps close the carburetor to a desired point. And when the engine wants to stall, it starts leaning out and adding more gas into the mixture, revving the engine up higher, and then reducing it as needed. This is actually really efficient. The way I have this set up now is probably the most efficient I've been able to get it. And I've been able to run this thing off of a small, let's see if I have something to represent. I'd say I was able to run this thing off the float bowl for a good 20 minutes. On the float for 20 minutes under load. That is extremely efficient. Now keep in mind I have like what? I'd say that's half a gallon gas tank. Maybe a little bit less than that. But about half a gallon of gas tank right there. You can run that for quite some time. Um, I've never actually tested how many hours it'd be able to run, but 
I do would like to put a little hour meter up here uh, on it and also install uh, on a full tank and actually monitor this thing under a good 600 watt load just to see. It's a very simple governor and you'll see it when it starts up. The governor revs like a Detroit diesel because Detroit diesel governors are just, they're, they're funky. Uh, when you first turn them on. And this thing is just as funky. You'll see it opening, shutting, opening and shutting. And it takes a while for it to stabilize. But when it does stabilize, it is very fuel efficient. It's just because, unfortunately, I don't have a choke on there. It can make things a little difficult. But nothing that a good old Cosby method of a rag full of gas won't solve. Or ether. In this case, I might just use WD-40. It might have a better effect. But we'll see. So as you can obviously see, I keep it on a cart for a reason. This is why, often than not, normally we don't really lose power that badly out here, but when we do lose it, it could be for a couple of minutes to a couple of days. You really don't know. And therefore, I like to keep the thing primed and running and at least take it out to start. I started it last, uh, yesterday, after I rebuilt the governor, so... Might need to put some gas in that intake. We actually fill the tank up anyhow, just to be sure. Okay, so we're going to put the engine under some heavy load now. The load I'm going to put on, it's a space heater. It makes about 1,000 watts, or is it more like 1,500 watts? The generator can only really handle about 6 to 7 to 8 graciously, so it's going to obviously pop the breaker on it, but you can see how the governor reacts and how it keeps the voltage in check. breaker pop here. This is really a lot of load for this poor little engine. The breaker just popped. Here 
hear the fader and the windings for the generator sparking and arcing. A little too much voltage for it, but you can hear it wants to run that much voltage. by holding off the spark. It went off and read. It itself back. If I try shutting the throttle all the way. shows how it works. It's not a bad engine at all. A lot of love and a lot of life. Out there. 